The galvanic cell concept is hugely, hugely important in everyday life because this principle of converting chemical energy to electrical energy is the basis of batteries. We can carry chemicals around with us and essentially convert their energy into electrical energy at will. So a galvanic cell acts like a kind of battery where the negative side of the battery is the anode side. This is the side that electrons issue forth from, is how I think about it. So negative sign over there. And the positive side is the cathode side. And this is the side where conventional current issues forth from, or we can think about it equivalently as where electrons come into. In the remainder of this video, we're going to talk about a notation for galvanic cells, recognizing that this picture is very visually complicated, and we want some simpler way to represent a galvanic cell, for example, in textual form, so that we don't have to pull out a figure like this every time we want to talk about, think about a galvanic cell. And cell notation comes to the rescue for this. Cell notation is a set of standard conventions for writing the components of a galvanic cell and the concentrations of any aqueous species. And from this textual description of the, the galvanic cell, we can reconstruct a picture like we had on this slide, and we can get some useful thermodynamic information about the cell, including the voltage we would expect it to be able to deliver, something we'll often call the cell potential. All right, so what goes into the cell notation? Well, first of all, we need to include all the components, all the chemical species that matter, anything that appears in the balanced chemical equation for the redox reaction that occurs in the cell needs to appear in the cell notation. We represent interfaces as single vertical lines, and we separate two or more components in the same phase using commas. This isn't that common for two redox active things to be, for example, both in aqueous solution in a galvanic cell, although it can happen, and we're just going to use commas to separate those things. And we use a double parallel line to separate the anode and cathode right at the middle of the cell notation. The final thing we need to take note of is that the anode is written on the left. The oxidation half reaction, the components of that oxidation half reaction are written on the left, and the cathode is written on the right. And the reason we do this is so that electron flow, we can think of spontaneous electron flow as occurring from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the cell notation. So we put the anode on the left and the cathode on the right. Let's return to our galvanic cell involving copper and silver right here in figure three. If we want to write cell notation for this, we first need to know that the copper half reaction is the anode. And so we're going to write that first. And we're going to list the components, typically with the more reduced thing first, to show the oxidation process from copper zero to copper two. So we're first going to write, and we're going to put it in blue because these are the components of the anode, copper solid. Now that copper solid is in a phase of its own. It's in a solid phase by itself. The copper two nitrate solution is an aqueous solution at a concentration of one mole per liter. We haven't mentioned that concentration yet, but it's going to matter profoundly when we start talking about cell potential. So that does need to be included in the cell notation. So we're on to a new phase. We're going to draw a vertical line. We're going to include copper nitrate here with the aqueous phase designator, and we're going to include one molar or one mole per liter in the cell notation as well. I'm going to move this down and give myself a little bit more space. And now we're actually done with the anode side. Since we're moving over to the cathode, we're going to use two vertical lines to indicate separation of the anode and cathode. Now on the cathode side, the first question to ask yourself is where are the electrons going? Well, they're going into the aqueous silver plus cation. So the next thing we'll want to list is the aqueous silver nitrate solution, AgNO3, Aq. And the molarity here is one molar as well. And let's just double check that. And yep, there it is, one molar solution of silver nitrate or AgNO3. 
When that silver plus cation is reduced, we end up with silver metal, and this is in a solid phase distinct from the aqueous solution right here. And so we're going to use a single vertical line to separate out that solid silver phase and write AG solid here. And for the solids, we don't need any measure of concentration or amount or anything like that since those are not thermodynamically important, as we'll see a bit later when we talk about calculating cell potentials from information about galvanic cells. And that's it. In fact, from this information, we could reconstruct the picture in figure three, including the concentrations of copper two and silver one in the galvanic cell. Here's another example of a galvanic cell involving a magnesium anode and a platinum cathode where iron three is being reduced to iron two. So the platinum cathode is actually not a reactive component. It's just there essentially to ferry electrons into the cathode, if you like. We've got NaCl in the salt bridge. The components of the salt bridge are actually not relevant since those ions are unreactive. They're just there to balance charge. So we don't need to include those. And actually, even without a ton of knowledge about the underlying redox reactions, we can go ahead and write the cell notation here based on what we see in the figure. So we see, for example, that the, at the magnesium anode, Mg metal is undergoing oxidation to Mg2+. And this is the anode side, so we're going to write it first. So let's go ahead and, and write that. We've got magnesium metal. This is the ultimate source of the electron, magnesium solid. And upon oxidation, that becomes MgCl2 aqueous, and the concentration of that is 0 0.1 molar. And this is all we need for the anode side. Since we're onto the cathode, we're going to add that black double line like this. Now on the cathode side, what's actually happening here is the reduction of Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus. And so First question we ask ourselves is where are the electrons going? They're going into the Fe3 plus, aqueous Fe3 plus, and the concentration of those guys is 0 0.2 molar. Notice that came from this little note here, 0 0.2 molar FeCl3. Actually, let's go ahead and write FeCl3 here just to be extra careful and include all the components here, not necessarily just the redox active components. Now, in the same phase, we have iron two chloride. So I'm gonna use a comma here since we also have FeCl2 in aqueous solution and its concentration is different. Its concentration is 0 0.3 molar. And finally, last but not least, we do want to include the fact that a platinum electrode is being used here to deliver electrons to the cathode side. This is done using another horizontal line like this because the platinum is in a solid phase by itself. Here's our platinum cathode right here. And we can just list that as PT solid. So this galvanic cell introduces some of those quirks of cell notation. We've got two components in aqueous solution, FeCl3 and FeCl2. Their concentrations are different, and we list those here. You'll sometimes see these listed just with commas after the chemical formula and the phase designator, but this works as well. We've got the inert platinum electrode listed last with a vertical line because it's in a separate phase from the redox active Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus here. And on the anode side, we've got a pretty standard situation, except the MgCl2 is there in a concentration of 0.1 mole per liter. Notice that using this information in the cell notation, we could reconstruct this figure above, and we could also write the half reactions that are occurring in the galvanic cell. For example, I could notice that magnesium solid is becoming not exactly magnesium chloride, but magnesium 2 plus in aqueous solution, since after all, MgCl2 is going to dissociate into Mg2 plus and Cl minus, and to counterbalance the charge, two electrons are lost on the anode side. 
And on the cathode side, well, I can see that aqueous Fe3 plus from the FeCl3 is undergoing reduction and picking up one electron to form a reduced Fe2 plus in aqueous solution. So this is my reduction process on the cathode side. 